Thank you for auditing Professor Sky's record review, the always positive new music review show hosted by a French professor who got up early before his family woke up on a Saturday morning, the first weekend of his school year, just to talk about the new album by Bill Callahan, Gold Album. I'm very excited to talk about this. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about him that much. I'm not going to talk about my thoughts on Bill Callahan and his place in music and his place in my life because I did that for like an hour and a half about his last album, Shepherd in the Sheepskin Vest. You can see the link up there. Those are some of, I think, my best videos, especially part three. I got really personal in that one. I talk a lot about my life and divorce and the way that sad music can help you be a happy person. So go check that out. But I want to get right into this record particularly because Bill Callahan himself announces his entire project by the opening track. So let's just get right in. The opening track is called Pigeons, and it starts with a little delicate guitar and him saying these words. Hello, I'm Johnny Cash. Now the first time I was listening to this, my daughter was in the room. And she goes, isn't Johnny Cash dead? And I had to sort of explain, yes, it's kind of a joke. And it's kind of a joke. Why is Bill Callahan saying, hello, I'm Johnny Cash? Now, first of all, if you've ever owned a guitar and a microphone and started playing music, you have made this joke at some point in your life. It's like one of the most tired jokes. It's almost like the play free bird of like starting to sing because the beginning of, of Folsom Prison, the, the album by Johnny Cash recorded at prison, or one of the albums recorded at a prison, that's how he starts off the whole show. And he plays the track Folsom Prison Blues maybe his best song, by saying, hello, I'm Johnny Cash. But this is Bill Callahan we're talking about, the world's most profoundly sad and moving person who can sing about depression and isolation like nobody else. Well, why is he making a joke to start off this album? That is announcing the nature of the album itself. Compared with the last record, which I'll just call Shepherd from here on out, Compared with Shepard, this album is just like a little throwaway. I mean, Shepard took years to come out, and, and, and it was so heavy. And I mean, every single word and every line of every track was just so brilliant. It makes you cry. I mean, it made me cry the first time I listened to it. This is kind of a throwaway. It's a lot simpler. There's lots of jokes. He's goofing around. A couple times on the album, he talks about laughing. On the track 35, he says, I had to laugh. Certainly starting off an album by saying, hello, I'm Johnny Cash, when you're not Johnny Cash is funny. He goofs around for an entire song that I'll talk about, just saying how much he likes the musician Ry Cooter. The family trauma and the personal living shipwreck of his own life is just put aside, because there is more to him, and that's not his only register. He's always had a sense of humor, and even a sense of humor about himself. And that is what this album is. It's dedicated to that. He's in the role of kind of, much like Johnny Cash, is he's kind of in the role of an observer. Somebody who can talk about life, but doesn't have to always talk about his. It seems like, more or less, that he's happy. This is his happy album. Talking about happy themes and love and life. And there's some sad notes here and there. But in general, it's just like the beginning tells you, hello, I'm Johnny Cash. Certainly, I think part of that, too, is that it's kind of a cowboy album. There's a song called Cowboy. The themes are very Western. The cover is like a car driving through the, the West at night. This song t all takes place in Texas. It like, makes references to the place where the fake Alamo is and, and talks about little cities all over Texas. So it's definitely in that. But most interestingly, I would say, the theme that makes this fascinating to me and that this character and this song embodies is being alone and not lonely, or even being lonely, but not lonely. <laughs> Do you understand? It's like, you can, be, you can be lonely or lonely. And this is his song about being lonely, being okay with being on the road, being okay with being alone in the house or being in a different room than the person that you love, and just being all right. I am haunted, my whole life I've been haunted by this one lyric by Smog, by Bill Callahan, which I'm probably going to misquote right now, so feel free to correct it in the comments. But he, he talks about, when he was a younger man, he talks about doing, I think, 37 push-ups in a hotel room. And he feels like Travis Bickle, the guy from Taxi Driver. And I remember so many times in my life, like, hearing that, like, just doing push-ups alone, because I used to do push-ups alone in a hotel room all the time, and feeling like Travis Bickle, you know, and like, that's my life. But this guy is married, 
seems like he has kids. I believe, if I remember correctly, he has kids now. He's like kind of through that. So now when he's alone, he's not sitting there shaving a mohawk. If you talk in the meeting, he's just kind of laughing and thinking about goofy things and making music. It's really beautiful and really moving. And I haven't even talked about the actual song yet. I'm gonna get there. But everything is set up just by this little half joke of hello, I'm Johnny Cash. Musically, the album follows this template very much because it's very sparse. It's mostly just guitar and vocals with his very low smog vocals very high in the mix. At times there'll be a double guitar, at times there'll be like kind of like whining guitars in the back, a little bit of electric guitars. On the last song, you hear something that sounds like a drum um, and a fair amount of horns that come in. And that's the mo that's it. That's really it. It's a very simple album. And again, I say this album is a bit of a throwaway, but I don't mean that. Like, I don't mean that it's not a great album. It's great. You should get it and listen to it. What I mean is that it's just so much lighter than Shepard that it has that feeling. The production is less overwrought. Okay, so let's talk about this song. Let's talk about what this song is actually about and then I'll play you some of it. Um, it's about a pigeon. No, it's about a limo driver who drives people after their wedding. So this is a, a very interesting idea, right? I mean, if you've ever been married and you've had a limo driver, you know there's a limo driver. And there's a very weird relationship because, um, because like, you're the, like the, at the at the this big moment in your life, and you're about to go off and and experience life with your partner, and then there's a stranger who's driving you around. It's very weird, right? It's it's, it's a very weird tradition, and so this is a great example of the ability that Bill Callahan has to like create a template and to create a character, and that's the thing, you know. If we if we have Bill Callahan early in his career talking about Travis Bickle, the guy who in Taxi Driver who tried to shoot the president, who's obsessed with an underage prostitute. You have this kind of character, isolated loneliness, skinny, scraggy, bony anger, right? That's that angry, lonely loner. This guy is not a loner. He spends his whole day by himself driving around in a car, but he's not alone. And he's not alone because He's married, and he talks about that very quickly. He has this job because he got married. So here it is. Potentially, you could have this character be a grizzled, divorced, angry person who sees all these loves and is gonna crash on the rocks. And certainly, the first metaphor that is given is about pigeons. Pigeons eating the rice from the wedding, exploding over San Antonio because that's like the, the urban legend. Is that true, by the way? Does, does that actually happen? What they say is that when pigeons eat the rice thrown at weddings, it expands in their stomachs and they die. They explode and die. I don't think that's true, but that's a great metaphor for talking about how crappy marriage is and what all this BS, you know, this is just some weird, you know, ritual that we do to try to believe that we're more than just like apes, man, like just trying to get, just trying to couple up and, but that's not it. Like he uses this really grotesque urban legend and then completely drops it. He teases you with cynicism. Like there's no, this is a completely uncynical album. Well, not completely. There's a couple, a couple moments where it gets a little bit cynical. But in general, this guy is a happy dude driving and he's gonna tell you about it. Um, it's an awesome character. This is an awesome character. And I think, like Johnny Cash was able to do, uh, and like Leonard Cohen was able to do, which we'll talk about in a second, like to sing in the third person and use that as a way not to talk about somebody who doesn't matter to you or about somebody who's nothing like you, but using a third person to express some feeling you have within yourself, okay? So like, that's the beauty. And that's the beauty of this song, of this third person songwriting, is that he wants to communicate, I like marriage, I have thoughts on marriage. And this is how he's able to say it. It's great. I mean, it's too bad I got married last year because I could have played this at my wedding. It's that kind of song. Uh, it's also kind of interesting that the rhyming on this is sort of intentionally goofy. Like, he talks about the pigeons exploding somewhere over San Antone. E-O. And then he just rhymes on that O over and over and over again with Alamo. Like, very heavy, intentionally pointed out uh, rhymes. And then we get to the part I'm gonna play for you. 
So there's this section where the person sees the ring on his hand and asks him, what do you think about marriage? And I'm gonna play you this whole bit of the song. This is the sort of musical highlight of the entire record because there's this quiet and then all these horns come in and it's this beautiful sort of explosion of Bill Callahan's thoughts. And I think this also exemplifies a lot about this album. So I'm gonna play you just this section from Pigeons from the position of a limo driver driving the newlyweds. Well, I fought through miles As I drove with a smile And I said, when you are dating, we only see each other And the rest of us go to hell. But when you are married, you're married to the whole wide world. Pretty, right? Those horns come in and that kind of, whoo, in the background. So this is another thing I'd, I want to say about this album. The, the expression, I thought about it for a mile, is... I, I, I can't get this thought out of my head. Bill Callahan is such a good songwriter that of course, he, he must have, I would love to see his notes. I would love to see his notes because I bet he wrote down, I thought about it for a minute and then said, no, 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 no. Because if I'm a limo driver, a minute takes about a mile, right? If you're going 60 miles per hour, it takes about a, so I thought about it for a mile. Like the idea of like thinking in distance, perfect, just great, an awesome lyric, which for the rest of my life, while I am driving, if someone asks me a question, I'm going to think about it in terms of the distance I have traveled while thinking. Beautiful. And then he says this line, and I cannot, and the doctor and Mrs. Payne, my wife, we discussed for like 10 minutes yesterday, is this deep or dumb? When you are married, you are together, the rest of the world can go to hell, but when you are married, you are married to the whole world as well. And then goes on saying, the rich and the poor, the straight and the gays, and the people who say you can't use those words these days. So I don't have an answer. I mean, when I first read it, I thought it was like, you're married to the whole world, like the rest of the world is your wife. That's not what he's saying. But he's talking about the, the way that when you get married, all of a sudden, everybody knows that you're together and like your individuality disappears. So you go from being like just these two people who are deeply in love to sort of a part of the rest of the society and the rest of the world and like you can't distance yourself. Like by being married, you are somehow enmeshed into the rest of civilization, the rest of society, no matter what. And you lose that intimacy of the two to become a sort of part of the whole. Oh, I got my answer. That's deep. <laughs> it's not dumb. Uh, props to Wisecrack for that. Uh, that concept of deep or dumb. They have lots of videos called deep or dumb. Yes, I think it is pretty deep. And, and that, is, that is true. And that, that does happen when you get married, that you feel this sense that all of a sudden you're part of everything. And then he goes on and says, like, I wonder how my words were taken. And we never get the answer. And he admits that he can be preachy, which is perfect because Bill Callahan can be preachy. He can, you do get the sense that if you're at dinner with him, you might not get a lot of words in. You know, like he might just be talking a lot about how things and being very smart and very used to hearing himself speak. But he says that when he talks about love, he becomes a hyperpotentiate, some fancy word, no, plenipotentiary, except <laughs> for somebody who likes to talk a lot. But that's that sense of humor about himself, which he also has throughout this album. And then he ends by saying, signed L. Cohn, making a reference to Leonard Cohen, another dead guy. <laughs> Um, and I think this is intentional because he's, Leonard Cohen's also very capable of writing these kinds of very meaningful songs, being slightly self-aware, pushing things out there and making you think and feel at the same time. I do wonder because the, the other, the other musician he directly references is Ry Cooter. Is he just stuck in the C section of the record store? <laughs> he just go to a record store and just go, oh, I liked this Johnny Cash. Oh, I like, I like this Ry Cooter. I don't know. You know, maybe, maybe next, maybe next album it'll be the D section. So let's kind of keep on moving through. But I mean, this is what I just said, 15 minutes. This is what the album's about. I'm going to go through the rest of it. But that feeling, 
that what I just described is what happens throughout the entire album. I don't think it ever gets that good. That song is the best song, probably by a far, but it still proves the idea of this project and why it's so interesting. So the next track is called Another Song, fairly gentle, almost like a Harvest era Neil Young track. Uh, maybe that's just because the, the snares kind of do the you know, with the brushes. Um, and he talks about being lonesome in a pleasant way. And again, much like the limo driver, he's no longer Travis Bickle, he is lonesome in a pleasant way. The title itself, Another Song, does indicate a certain amount of boredom. I mean, maybe he's just doing the thing that Leonard Cohen does, where like a lot of his albums are just like 12 more songs, five more songs, three more songs. You know, maybe he's just sort of trying to do that, like demystify the artistic process while being some kind of beautiful artistic genius. Um, I don't quite know. Also, another kind of funny thing while we're talking about these, you know, actually, I'm gonna come back to musical influences later at, at the song Ride Cooter. Then we come to the track 35, and this has a really beautiful moment, which ties in well with the nature of this review, actually, where he says that he can't see himself in the books that he reads anymore. And he used to be able to see himself on every page. This is just great because a lot of the last album and this album is about being older, right? About being middle-aged, like me. I mean, he's older than me, but still. And like, it's true that when you're younger, you see yourself more in books because books are more about young people's lives and the adventures and the things they do. And there's not that many books about, you know, marriage and, and sort of middle-class domestic bliss. I mean, the you know, Revolutionary Road, <laughs> I, I, it's a really depressing book about a marriage that's falling apart, which as a divorced man, I can tell you is a very good book. And if you've ever been divorced, you will find yourself in Revolutionary Road. But most books are about the solitary figure, usually male, usually white, in the history of literature, I'm saying, usually, going out and discovering the world and being inside their mind. And he now no longer feels that way. And I think that's beautiful. And I think it's also about the fact that young people romanticize more. They see their lives in these kinds of grand terms. When I say romanticize, I mean live as though they're living in a book. And that is what is happening throughout our lives. And so this is a song about being old and being wise and being okay. Um, I, I will say, actually, I, I, I should have, I have a lot of things out here. I do have a piece of advice that I like to talk about a fair amount on this class. And I have an answer for you, Bill. The answer is to read Proust. <laughs> this guy started writing when he was like 40. So if you want to understand all of human emotions, especially if you're a kind of tortured artistic type, um, you'll still find yourself in Proust. Just a little piece of advice. You're still in there. <laughs> but don't read Revolutionary Road, unless you want to get divorced again. Ooh. Um, this song's very nice musically. There's some great electronic guitar, uh, electronic, electric guitar used sparingly in points. Then we get to Protest Song, which is one of my favorite political songs of the Trump era because it is a political song about political songs. It's about, not radicalization, but about the way that maybe some of the people on the right are correct when they're frustrated at protest songs. So it's a very ominous guitar. And it's all about like wanting to go home and relax and watch TV. And instead of having a good sit, the great leveler, instead of having a good sit watching TV, there's someone playing a protest song like on a late night show. And this song is so drenched in irony. So this is, I believe, like, you know, a third person song again, you know, like the limo driver, um, of just some normal person, some presumably kind of right wing, kind of Republican-ish guy who really dislikes what's happening, coming home and sitting down and watching a protest song and getting so mad, getting mad at the mainstream media, getting mad at the left-wing uh, entertainers and all of that, except it's not really overt. You could listen to this whole song and never know that's what it's really about. At least I think that's what it's about. You, it's so subtle, it's a beautiful idea because it's, it's true. Like these protest songs are everywhere. And even me, who is fairly to the left, when I see someone singing anti-Trump song on TV, I change the channel as fast as I can. I mean, who cares? Wait, could this possibly be a reference to, to Kristen Wiig 
playing uh, Hallelujah the day after Trump got elected in honor of Leonard Cohen's death <clears throat> as like a protest. I don't think so. But that made me as angry as I could possibly be. <laughs> it was just terrible. But anyways, as the song goes on, it's in a very ironic register. It's very not sincere because this person who's singing is ridiculous. It's like, I saw a protest song. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> like the idea that like this person is totally shocked, scandalized by seeing a protest song. And then it keeps on going with this concept, step aside, son, you're gonna get hoit. And he keeps on saying that. Instead of saying hurt, he keeps on saying hoit. You're gonna get hoit over and over again. And he talks about how if I, if, if <laughs> that he's going to protest this protest song which if you're on Facebook and you have friends on both sides, like I do, uh, that's a very real sentence. Like, I'm going to protest this protest song saying he would vote for Satan if the person singing the protest song was against Satan. <clears throat> and this is great because this is not really a comment on Trump. It's not even really a comment on Trump supporters. It's a comment on the way that this system works where we just get divided and angry for no reason. I will say that it seems as though it kind of passes on to be talking about our current time um, you know, I do live in Rochester, New York, um, which has been in the news lately because of the, the police murder. And, um, and so, you know, there's been a lot of talk around and obviously on the, on the internet about the nature of looting and how people who are looting or rioting or protesting, any of those things interchangeably in, in the mind of the, the sort of political sphere that like they deserve to be hurt for messing with personal property. Like, we live in a weird time. If you're looking at this in the future, in 2020, there was a real debate about whether or not human life was equal to personal property. And that taking personal property, like, destroying personal property was completely ethically, morally acceptable to take someone's life. That's just a debate that it turns out we're having right now. Kind of a weird dystopian thing happening here. So in this song, the line is, uh, somebody must die, these boys are messing with a man's toys. And that's what a riot is, right? I mean, that's, that's the sense, right? Like, how dare you mess with my stuff, but stuff doesn't matter, somebody's gotta die. This is great. This, if you're making a, a collection of the best Trump era songs, this should be on there for its subtlety, its ability to see things clearly and not be preachy. It's a great, great track. God damn, I love Bill Callahan. Isn't it funny that I didn't listen to him for like 15 years? Like I really didn't. I just took a break. And he's like my favorite artist. Anyway, you should watch my, my other videos. Um, then the song Mackenzie's. Here, the old family trauma theme that he likes so much starts to come back. It's about like his car breaking down and this old man who comes out to help him because he's got the wisdom of an old man. And then he bonds. And then there's this like very sad moment where he says, I wish that the guy, Jack, the this old man helping him. I wish he'd call me son again. So it's clear that this is going back to his terrible relationship with his father, which has been one of his main themes throughout his entire career. Um, that he's like seeing this surrogate father figure just in one day. This is like a one night stand of a father figure. Like he wishes he would call him son again. And there's that real pain. And then in a real sort of Johnny Cash on the nose storytelling way, he goes, and this is actually not Johnny, it's like any good country song, okay? So you had this set up, and it's not syrupy or cheesy like a lot of country songs might be, but then you have the setup where it's this middle-aged guy wishing he had a, a, a cool older dad who helped him, and he goes upstairs to go to sleep in this guy's house, and he sees pictures on the wall of a son who is deceased. So you also have the old man who wishes to have a middle-aged son. It's very beautiful, drums come in, and it does read to me like a great country song where there's kind of like a little twist at the end and it's a little bit melodramatic, but very excellent. Uh, then that track, Breakfast, I don't like breakfast. I mean, I like breakfast. I'm gonna eat breakfast soon if I ever let my family up, if I ever wake them up. Um, but I, it's, it kind of reminds me of some of Nick Cave's songs about his wife where it's like, Dude, I get it that you're like this weird, mysterious genius, but like, I don't know. It's, you know what? I'm gonna be honest. I don't understand this song. I just don't get it. So I'm not gonna say I don't like it. 
Bill Callahan, I trust Bill Callahan enough to know that if I don't like something, it's probably because I'm stupid. So could someone please explain to me what breakfast is about? I mean, it seems that it's about him being in the other room, hearing his wife cooking him breakfast and being happy about it. But then there's this line, I drink so we don't fight, which is just like, that's not how alcoholism works, but also just, and then she doesn't drink so we don't fight. Like it feels too much like he's just sort of like a man baby who's mistreating his wife. That's how this feels. Like that Nick Cave album where he talks about his wife as my nurse. It has that feeling. I don't like it. I mean, I think it's good to recognize imbalances in your relationship, but um, you're supposed to do something about them. <laughs> but I could be wrong. It could be about something else. It could be about something much more profound. So please tell me what Breakfast is really about. I do like that uh, this is the best singing on the album where he says, she don't drink so we don't fight. Like he goes over like many different lines, better than I just did, and it's really quite good. And then Cowboy, another kind of miss. It's like a Gene Autry, boom, 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 guitar line. Um, this is really about that loneliness, being okay with being alone. All I need is water, whiskey, and buffalo meat, and stuff like that. It's okay. This is a nice trumpet in there. Um, and I like the line, I'm trying to fit it all in before the test pattern Indian. Because at the end of telev television used to end at a certain time, like midnight, one o'clock. And they used to just show what was called a test pattern, which is an image of an of a Indian head. You know, with the feathers, you know, like whole headdress. I think it was a Sioux, if I had to guess, based on the tribe. And that was just a weird thing. So this idea of like trying to get everything in your life before it, and the cowboy and the Indian, it's kind of, a, kind of a fun play on words. And it does fit with the whole Western theme of this album. Then we go up, we go with the track Ride Cooter. And this is where he's just having his most fun. I, I don't have Ride Cooter on vinyl. This is, this is my only Ride Cooter. I just great music by Ry Cooter. It's like a soundtrack album, all these different soundtracks that he's done, like Paris, Texas. Um, yeah, Paris, Texas, I think would actually be a good movie to accompany this album. You know, like a, like a non-Texan a non using Texas backdrop to get to some deeper truths, right? Um, so this is just beautiful because it's just talking about how great Ry Cooter is. And if you don't know Ry Cooter, well, you know him, you just don't know it. He's a great slide guitar player. He's, I mean, he really should be one of the world's greatest heroes. Like, everybody should know him. And this song is just like, this Ry Cooter, he's a real straight shooter. Like, he plays really good guitar, but he does all these things. Like, the Buena Vista Social Club, like, he was the main driving musical force behind that. Um, Ali Farcarture, the great um, guitar player from Mali, he helped to popularize him. Like he just goes around finding great world music and producing it and publishing it and bringing attention to it. And he does it all in just this very calm and cool way. And his soundtrack musics are just astounding. There used to be, maybe you can help me, my auditors. When I was growing up, my brother Ward, my oldest brother, huge Ry Cooter fan. There was like a bounty. If I ever found this one Ry Cooter album, I would get the best prize ever, his respect. And it's the soundtrack to the movie Streets of Fire, the Walter Hill movie from 1985, maybe. Good movie, overlooked. Walter Hill's a great director, too. Um, but, like, he said, like, if you find this, like, this is the thing I'm looking for most in the world. And still to this day, every time I go to a record store, I look for the Streets of Fire record. I've never looked it up on eBay. That's funny. <laughs> Anyways, I don't know if it exists, but it's a great example of his ability to write great soundtrack music. And this whole song is this goofy, tongue-in-cheek song all about just how great Ry Cooter is as a musical figure. You know, all the British stars, they get their money and they snort it up their nose and he just does another yoga pose. It's like Chaturanga, he says some yoga pose. It's funny, it's true, it's interesting, and it's part of this whole, this whole musical world that he's putting forth for us in the C section of the record store of these heroes, and he's just trying to fit himself in there. Callahan, hey, Callahan, Cash, Cohen, Cooter, right? He's sort of trying to fit himself in this place by taking on different aspects. And in this case, he's just trying to be the relaxed, cool guy, not the self-destructive, not, the, not the, the, the fire that's burning out, but just like Ry Cooter, long-lasting, very cool, excellent, 
able to change the world, able to do great things, but not doing it in a flashy way. It's great. I think it's, I think Raikuta should be a hero for middle-aged guys. <laughs> like this is how you can be, right? You don't have to all be Rambo, right? Um, a beautiful part in this song where he talks about, um, imagine him laying down a part right here where the music gets thin, bringing back the people who, who tuned out back in. And then there's just a quiet part. And if you're a Ry Cooter fan like I am, you can hear the, 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 the slide guitar. Like, you can hear it. It's not there, but you can totally imagine it. It's a beautiful sleight of hand, or sleight of ear, sleight of mouth, sleight of something, where he describes, like, imagine. Imagine Ry Cooter playing, and you can hear it. It would fit so well in the song. I would, I would, I would love to know if there's ever going to be, like, a remix where Ry Cooter jumps on. Because I think he's a really cool guy, as I've said. So just wonderful. I actually texted my brother Ward about this. I said, hey, you got to hear this song about Ry Cooter. Because that's just how awesome Ry Cooter is. And then the track ends with uh, As I Wander. Um, this really puts a, puts a bow on the whole concept of this being an album about being lonely. Not lonely. Because it's about kind of being in different rooms and different hotels and traveling where Paul, the Apostle Paul, traveled and rolled his horse and and some percussion in the back and even a little harmonica, I think. And it just puts this nice idea that he's still the wandering guy, right? Like, he's still in that hotel room that we fell in love with him for, right? But he's not doing push-ups like Travis Bickle. He's just maybe writing another song, maybe listening to Ry Cooter, just kind of happy, misses his family, he's happy to be married, he's okay. What a great album. So there it is. There's my review of Gold Album. I don't know why it's called Gold Album. Maybe he's done a, a review. I didn't research this album at all. I didn't even read the lyrics. So please tell me why is it called Gold Album. And if you're like a Bill Callahan super fan, um, like, do you like this album a lot too? Because I do. But I don't consider myself a super fan. There's still like three albums I've never even heard of his. So... I don't know. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to go uh, get the kids up. We are rebuilding the deck. Like, you know, I'm actually going to show you. Who cares, right? I mean, if this album is all about, like, uh, all about uh, domestic bliss, that's what our deck looks like now, okay? So, so someday I'll show you. I'll show you when we fix it. All right. Time for breakfast. There's the camera.